All right, let's uh, proceed to the final talk uh, of this uh, week. So, uh, Martin Pimon from Technical University of Vienna. Yeah, thank you. Seems like I'm have the honor to close this uh, conference. Uh, we had some technical difficulties, so we had to p convert the slides to the PDF format. And I will, I, I lost the transitions, but I will use my mouse pointer to guide you through the slides. So just uh, as a disclaimer. Okay, let's get started. Um, my talk is uh, going to be about electrons go nuclear, a unique interaction with thorium 229. Now, this is more on the application side of active learning. Um, and uh, I joined this uh, workshop to learn more about it, so I don't can I can't show you any new results on that, but I hope to get you inter interested in this fantastic system. So uh, first, let's uh, try to locate thorium in the periodic table because not everyone may be so familiar with this element. It is in the row of the actinides. It has a nuclear charge of ninety, four valence electrons, and all isotopes are unstable. There is a um, semi-stable one, which is thorium-232. It has a half-life of the age of the universe. And the um, interesting, or for our purposes, interesting nucleus has a half-life of 8,000 years, thorium-229. Now, what's so special about thorium-229, you might wonder? Well, this can be summarized very briefly. It has a remarkably low nuclear excitation energy. Its first excited nuclear level is only 8.3 EV above the ground state. And it is a metastable uh, state. And this is what nuclear physicists call isomer. And just to illustrate how rare or how unique this nucleus is, uh, we can have a look at this figure to the right where uh, the green dots are all known nuclear isomers. And on the y-axis, we have a logarithmic energy scale. And you can see that usually they are between 10 to the 4 to uh, 10 to the 7 EV. And this thorium nucleus, it stands out with its energy being in range of uh, usual electronic energies. Now, this leads to some very interesting properties, and uh, one of which is its lifetime. So the lifetime of the nuclear excited state. In neutral thorium-229, it is seven microseconds. And uh, the bare nucleus, so totally ionized uh, I, um, atom, it is 30 minutes. So the lifetime of this nucleus depends on the electronic environment. And that is because of an effect called internal conversion. So when the nucleus decays, uh, it does not emit a gamma ray, but instead it excites an electron. Uh, sorry, it, instead uh, it transfers its energy to the electron. And for uh, the uh, heavier isotopes, this is the dominant decay mechanism of the isomers because the ratio of decay um, originating from internal conversion to gamma ray decay scales with the nuclear charge cubed and, uh, and also with the um, principal quantum number uh, cubed, meaning that core electrons are more likely to participate in this uh, internal conversion scheme. Now, usually internal conversion ionizes the atom because the energies are just too large. But in thorium 229, there's this um, uh, property that, okay, the first excitation energy, sorry, the first ionization energy is 6.3 EV. The second ionization energy is 12.1 EV, meaning that starting from singly ionized thorium 229, internal conversion does not ionize the atom but it excites an electron instead. So this is what many people call bound internal conversion. I like to use the term electron bridge because um, of the following reason. I will explain uh, it shortly. So what are the conditions for such an electron bridge or bound internal conversion process? Well, first we need to have energy conversion. So there needs to be an electronic level that matches the nuclear energy but this does not need to be exact. Instead, it can be bridged by a photon. So for instance, if there's an electronic transition that has 10 EV, um, then you, uh, a photon with an energy of 1.7 EV may be emitted to account for the energy difference. 
there also needs to be an s character of the wave function. Remember that s uh, states have a finite probability at the nucleus. And the usual selection rules concerning total angular momentum and parity apply. Now, this is, um, I have not talked about any sort of system, so it could just have been the free atom. But what we try to analyze is, can we somehow influence the effect when we dope this thorium atom into, the, uh, into a solid state? So what are the advantages of doping thorium-229 into a material with a band gap larger than this transition energy? Well, we did density functional theory calculations, and I have to give credit to Andreas Grünas and Peter Mohn at TUV. Uh, and others uh, were um, doing this analysis as well. Um, and we calculated the density of states of calcium fluoride doped with thorium. And we found that uh, the uh, thorium totally, uh, the valence electron of, of thoriums will get absorbed by the lattice. So it's thorium four plus. And the valence states or that were for the free atom, the valence states are now unoccupied in the crystal. And they are situated within the band gap of the material and they are very flat. So the unoccupied defect states retain atomistic pro properties, which is beneficial for the electron bridge effect. In addition, the valence band offers a lot, flex a lot of flexibility towards uh, more electronic transitions uh, just to participate. And there's also experimental ease like no ultra high vacuum and no cooling, etc. cetera. So, Thor, uh, cal thorium doped calcium fluoride is of relevance because these crystals are grown at the Technical University of Vienna. Uh, the head of the group is Thorsten Schum. And here on this image, I show you a freshly grown thorium doped calcium fluoride crystal. And to the left and to the right, it is after a few days. So you can see the alpha decay really damages the crystal. And unfortunately, I couldn't bring a sample to show you because this, yeah, this would be radioactive. But <laughs> I guess the customs wouldn't have liked that. So um, we did the calculations and uh, calculated the DFT wave functions that we uh, supplied to the group of Adriana Palfibus at the University of Würzburg. And uh, she and some other very smart people from her group uh, developed a formalism to calculate electron bridge transition rates from the DFT wave functions. And the main result is uh, summarized in this picture where uh, we see the electron bridge transition rate depending on these thorium level energies. And what I want you to focus on is that there is a resonance around the nuclear energy. And the width of this resonance is depending um, is depending on the strength of the nucleus electron coupling. But what about other materials? Clearly, or possibly, calcium fluoride is not the best candidate uh, for, for the electron bridge transition. So our objective is now to find a material which maximizes this electron nucleus coupling. And the workflow is pretty clear. First, we try to determine the defect structure. Then we calculate the electronic structure, including excited state levels. And finally, the electron bridge rates. And this could just be iterated for materials with a band gap that is larger than this 8.3 EV. Now there is a caveat, and that's that these calculations can be very uh, demanding. So to determine the defect structure of a, of a system with low symmetry, we may need to calculate hundreds of structures. And just one material could consume easily 100,000 CPU hours, which if you use a lot of resources, you can do in a few days. But similarly, to calculate excited state levels accurately is also a big problem. And uh, we did some G0W series calculations on our cluster for a few days, and we uh, need at least a terabyte of memory. So we are both memory and CPU limited in this project. And uh, calculation of electron bridge rates is relatively fast. So calculation time by material is at least a week. Um, and that's why this seems like a good uh, application to do some machine learning. So 
uh, what could we do to actively learn the electron nuclear coupling? Well, first we have to think about how, to, how do we reduce the workflow cost. And I would say um, we don't need to use as many defect structures per material and use smaller cells uh, just to generate training data. We don't maybe also need to do these excited state calculations for the training set um, and just leave the energies uh, of the conduction band as a rigid shift or the defect states as a parameter. And uh, we calculate the electron bridge rates as usual to reduce the calculation time and material to a few hours. Now, um, this is currently where we're at. Uh, and the next question is, which descriptors can we use to train um, a, a model to these electron nuclear couplings? And uh, we, the transition rate is actually calculated by Fermi's golden rule, where you have the final state here and the initial state. Uh, sorry, the other way around, the final state here, initial state here, and here is the um, transition operators. And the first question, what we have to ask ourselves is, can we describe these by local descriptors? Is the interaction local? Well, indices M and G denote nuclear states. They are most local, not naturally. Index D indicates a defect state, which is localized around the defect. Index O is a valence band state. Well, these are semi-localized. They can extend uh, quite uh, to a large degree, but they are still localized around the defect. However, there's a complication and that's these transition rates are calculated in a perturbative approach. So all unoccupied electronic states enter this equation as well and they are maximally delocalized. So uh, this is currently the focus of our study and I can't tell you more about it, unfortunately, at this point. Uh, if this is even um, an application possible to, to learn with local descriptors. And uh, in the mid or long term, the question will be, how do we design a material given large uh, uh, electron bridge rates? And uh, for that, this is a classic uh, inverse, um, inverse design problem. And uh, can we learn something about the structure for, uh, from the descriptors? Uh, is also a question that we will have to answer. Now, you may be wondering uh, what's uh, this all about and why is this so useful? Well, uh, in the field of quantum metrology, this state has a uh, lot of interesting prospects. Um, quantum metrology, by the way, is the field of uh, the science of measurement. So uh, you have probably heard of the SI unit definition of the um, uh, second, which is based on some reference date from the cesium atom. Well, we believe that thorium-229 will be, or maybe in the future, the new reference transi transition because of the following properties. It has a long lifetime and therefore a very small line width. It's relatively high energy means it has a high frequency and the uh, uh, time can be more often sampled, so to sp loosely speaking. And the nucleus is shielded against the environment and uh, 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 from the electronic shell. And for that reason, uh, people usually call this the nuclear clock. And if you're interested and you want to read more about it, I can recommend this excellent paper by Kjeld Biggs, um, the thorium-229 low energy isomer and the nuclear clock, nature reviews. And, uh, the accuracy of this state is quite impressive. It's uh, less than a tenth of a second over the age of the universe. But even more uh, important may be that the energy is just large enough that we uh, can do precision laser spectroscopy of this nucleus. And this would, uh, is the first time that a nucleus can be manipulated by laser radiation. And this would uh, enable a search for physics beyond the standard model. And uh, I want to quickly mention uh, a few of the many uh, experimentalists working really hard to make the nuclear clock a reality. Uh, Kjeld Beeks, Tomasz Sigorski, and uh, Georgi Kazakov from Thorsten's group. Yeah, with that, um, I, I'm finished with my presentation. And I also end with a machine learned, a machine AI generated image 
And I can also give you the prompt, realistic atomic nucleus interacting with electromagnetic radiation. And you can decide for yourself if you believe this is realistic, but I like to think that this is the thorium nucleus and you can see the electronic wave function intending, uh, extending to the nucleus and the photons participating in this interaction. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions from the audience? Uh, here or online, yes. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Um, so you said uh, in the end that the, the nucleus is shielded from the environment, but uh, doesn't it work both ways? So the nucleus, nuclear uh, excited state can excite an electron when it decays, but exactly. it, the um, electron can also decide to excite the nucleus. Mm. Seems to be contradictory. Uh, the um, difference is that in the electron bridge effect, we need another photon to trigger it. So the spontaneous rate is rather low. And um, in the case that the thorium defect states would actually match the nuclear energy, then you would have, uh, yes, you would have large interactions. But um, if, if, it, if we hope and we would uh, try to find materials where we have some sort of separation such that this doesn't happen. Thank you. Any other questions? Not at the moment. So thank you very much for the great talk. And uh, I ask you to stay here for just a moment longer. We have our closing words uh, from the organizers.